For our discussion of diagnosis and treatment of infective endocarditis, I will be following the 2015 Infectious Disease Society of America and American Heart Association guidelines, published in Volume 132 of Circulation. Sixteen authors, including infectious disease specialists, cardiologists, a nurse, a pharmacist, and a PhD scientist, create this very detailed document. 52 pages. The group rigorously evaluated all clinical research, 328 references, and classified the strength of their recommendations based on the treatment effect, one being very effective, and three being of no benefit or causing harm, and also evaluated the robustness of the evidence. A equals evidence based on large populations and multiple randomized trials or a meta-analysis, and B, based on limited populations and a single randomized or non-randomized trial, and C, simply a consensus of experts. Now let's return to the question I posed in the last video. Why is the diagnosis of infective endocarditis so difficult to make? We observe that many of the symptoms of this disease are nonspecific. <clears throat> well, it also, <clears throat> also turns out that the blood tests associated with this infection are also nonspecific. And this is another reason why the diagnosis is often delayed. 90% of patients have normochromic normocytic anemia like our patient, and their peripheral white count is usually normal. On occasion, the white count can be increased when there is a myocardial abscess. In 90 to 100 percent of cases, the CRP and ESR are elevated. If these tests are normal, endocarditis is unlikely. Urinalysis often reveals proteinuria, 5 to 65 percent, and hematuria, 30 to 50 percent. To help to more consistently make the diagnosis of endocarditis, investigators created Duke's modified criteria. The diagnosis is considered definitive if the patient has two major or one major and three minor or five minor criteria, and considered possible if the patient has one major and one minor or three minor criteria. The major criteria include positive blood cultures with the proper organism. At least three blood cultures should be drawn at separate sites, and the first and last should be drawn at least one hour apart to document a constant bacteremia. But more about this a little later. This approach is support, supported by strong evidence, 1A. And the second major criteria is evidence of endocardial involvement and should be documented using a transthoracic echocardiogram, TTE, combined with a transesophageal cardiac echo, TEE. Because because Coxiella burnetti or Q fever has a high risk of infecting the endocardium, a single positive blood culture for this organism or a titer of greater than 1 to 800 is considered another major criteria. Minor criteria include pre a predisposing heart condition, fever of greater than 38 degrees centigrade, vascular phenomena, arterial emboli, mycotic aneurysms, intracranial hemorrhages, conjunctival or splinter hemorrhages, and Janeway lesions. Immunologic phenomena, glomerulonephritis, Oster's nodes, raw spots, and the final one, a single positive blood culture with a typical organism, not coagulase negative staph. Why is it recommended that three blood cultures be drawn over one hour? Because remember the pathology of the vegetation. It is densely packed with bacteria, the dark material in the center of this image. The number of bacteria per gram of tissue is between 10 to the 9th and 10 to the 11th, and these bacteria dissociate from the vegetation at a relatively constant rate, much like a time-release medication tablet. The consequence is a continuous low-level bacteremia, very different from bacteremia associated with an abscess are other extravascular infections. These infections intermittently cause high-level bacteremia.
The other key diagnostic tool is cardiac echocardiogram. And the recommendations are to begin with the TTE. Unfortunately, this test has a sensitivity of only 65%. Therefore, if it is negative and you and if you feel the probability of endocarditis is between 4 and 60%, a transesophageal TEE echocardiogram should be ordered because this has a sensitivity of 95 to 100%. This study can detect vegetations of less than 10 millimeters. This test is also helpful in assessing the need for surgery and detects per perivalvular extensions of the infection into the myocardium. TEE is recommended for patients with prosthetic valves because this test better visualizes the prosthetic valve ring where stitch abscesses can form. As will be discussed later, the TEE is also useful in Staph aureus central venous line sepsis in deciding on the duration of antibiotic therapy. Here is a typical echocardiogram showing a vegetation on the aortic valve as well as a perivalvular abscess. Now you know how the diagnosis of infective endocarditis is made. Next you need to know how to treat this infection. In this topic, will be covered in the next video. Thank you.